Hi, Scott Thomas here, infrequent content creator and recovering heterosexual. You know what I fucking hate? When people's cold opens are interrupted by their intros. Like, there is no greater calling card of a shitty YouTuber than having that happen. Ah. What? <laughs> you thought I was about to have that happen to my- Okay, yep, yeah, that tracks. You know what's cool? Video games. You know what's cooler than that? Finding fulfillment in life. But when you can't do that, modding video games is pretty cool too. Let's talk about it. Fan-made modifications, or mods, might be the best thing to have ever happened to video games. In nearly no other medium can you find this same level of fan engagement and contribution to the source material as in a game's modding scene. Some games are even kept alive to this day by their vibrant and ever-growing modding community, consistently giving a new lease on life to games that otherwise may have become irrelevant a long time ago. From custom items to world overhauls to even fully voice-acted quest lines complete with brand new characters and locales, if you can think of it, chances are someone's made a mod for it. I mean, how else could you explain the nearly endless amount of sex mods for games like Skyrim or Fallout or S Stardew Valley? Simply put though, modding is absolutely amazing and I'm a really big fan of it. But in my humble opinion, which I respect, no game has benefited more from the modding scene than that of Fallout New Vegas. Back in 2020, smack dab in the middle of the quarantine, I finally got to play a modded playthrough of Fallout New Vegas, thanks Dark Populace, and it was everything that I had hoped for and more. To my surprise, I was able to pretty effectively recapture the same feeling of adventure and intrigue that I had back when I initially played New Vegas back in like 2012. I was still fairly new to adding mods to the game, but overall it was an amazing experience, being able to slowly breathe new life into what I consider to be one of the greatest games of all time. But with an abundance of free time and a good amount of existing knowledge about the game, it didn't take long for me to exhaust pretty much every quest avenue, reach the highest level, beat all the DLCs, and nearly 100% the game, mods and all. So with nothing left to do and this COVID thing not seeming to end anytime soon, I found myself back on the Nexus to see if I could once again breathe new life into New Vegas. That's when I discovered Dust. Fallout Dust is a survival horror mod for New Vegas that essentially overhauls every aspect of the game to make it more akin to a gritty, tough-as-nail survival horror experience. I'd seen some gameplay of it and had a passing understanding of what the mod entailed, but up to this point, I had never played it before. And I'll be honest with you, I did not have high hopes going in. Fallout Dust seemed to encapsulate a lot of different gaming characteristics that I don't often find myself enjoying. Things like resource management, or the entire rebalance of the difficulty system, or the slow progression of leveling up, or just the nails-bitingly difficult gameplay loop of dying and then dying again. I was certain when I had initially found out about Dust that I was just going to bounce right off of it. <sighs> Dust might be one of the best mods I've ever played for any game ever. Maybe, I, I don't know, that, that Stardew Sex mod's pretty high up there. But the point being that despite all my initial misgivings about the mod and what it would entail, I was given an experience I have never been given in any other gaming experience in my entire life. And if you'll allow, I'd like to rant to you about it for a while. But before we get into what makes Dust so great, let's start off by talking about the setting and a bit of the backstory for the mod itself. A burning hot sun, a cry for water, black wings circle the sky. Stumbling and falling, somebody's calling, you're lost on the desert to die. Fallout Dust takes place 20 years after the events of Fallout New Vegas. The courier, siding with either Mr. House or Yes Man, it's left ambiguous, takes control of Hoover Dam and orders the NCR to leave the Mojave altogether. And while they initially do so, it's not long until the NCR comes back with a vengeance, taking over the Vegas Strip completely and labeling the courier as a terrorist. What follows from there are 20 years of Murphy's Law work in overtime. The same toxic cloud found in the Sierra Madre Casino is unleashed upon the Strip. The tunnelers, true to Ulysses' warnings, completely invade the Mojave, and the radioactive dust storms that permeate the divide 
began to move westward, mixing with the aforementioned toxic cloud and plunging the entire Mojave wasteland into a hellish, suffocating haze of death and destruction. All known factions and communities are destroyed, either having been annihilated, eaten, or becoming a horrifying facsimile of their former selves. The Mojave you knew is dead and gone. And instead of the courier, you play as the survivor, a battle-worn everyman dead set on achieving the only quest given to you in the mod, escaping the Mojave. And I, I guess helping Happy Trails Caravan too, but don't, wor don't worry about that, that's a glitch. Essentially, the Mojave has become an utter hellhole. But wasn't the Mojave already a hellhole? I hear you ask. And no, dumbass. The base game Mojave had Prim Slim in it. Prim Slim at your service. Authentic cowpoke and official spokespot of the Vicky and Vance Casino and Museum. Yeehaw! Yeah, he's dead in dust, so that's how you know everything's fucked. However, despite all this, Dust's setting, tone, and general atmosphere have been a minor point of contention with a lot of people online, with some disregarding the mod completely for it being too edgy or comically dark. And while I can see where they're coming from to an extent, I really didn't feel that way when I initially played through the mod in 2020. Sure, there's definitely some fucked up stuff here and there, and I can understand someone being overwhelmed by just the sheer amount of depressing, dark imagery the mod regularly employs, land of the free, home of the brave, but again, I don't think it's ever to the mod's detriment. Dust's tone and depressing atmosphere are simply the prices of admission, and anyone who's actually played the mod will know that Dust's usage of these depressing themes is done pretty well. And I mean, shit, I played Dust at the height of the pandemic, like in the middle of fucking quarantine, and I had no problem getting into its dark and moody atmosphere, so don't hit me with that, it's too dark and edgy shit. The world was ending when I played it, and I still had a good time. I know it's weird to say that I think so fondly of an experience specifically made to be depressing, but the way in which these themes are handled in Dust, if you'll forgive the phrase, just works. You see it everywhere you look, and pretty much everywhere you go. The entire world as you know it have been perverted into a vaguely familiar version of its previous self. Old towns and settlements that you used to painstakingly do tasks for, gradually gaining the trust and admiration of their townsfolks and locals just to be revered as a hero, are gone. The once memorable faces and quest lines are replaced by a tapestry of horror that seems to repeat itself no matter where you go. Sure, the backstories of these places' respective collapses may vary from location to location, but the oppressive nature of destruction and loss follows you everywhere. It's the only constant left in this world. Well, that and the fact that you're constantly in danger. The Mojave in New Vegas was never something someone would call a safe place, but there were still a handful of peaceful settlements and NPCs that you could reliably talk with, shop from, or befriend, assuming you don't shoot them on sight. In Dust, there are no friendly faces. If it's walking on two legs, you can pretty reliably assume it wants you dead. And I do mean everyone, whether they be cannibals, mad survivors, tribals, raiders, tunnelers, rad scorpions, ghouls, or whatever the fuck else you're unfortunate enough to come across in your exodus of the Mojave. I've got a bone to pick with you! All the old friends you made back in the day are gone, having either left long ago or having become victims of the world they now find themselves in. I start to notice a trend here. If it existed in the base game and you enjoyed it, then you can bet your ass that Dust's version is equal parts horrifying and depressing. Yay! And I think that's why I like Dust's tone so much. It doesn't feel just dark for the sake of being dark, it feels dark in both an intentional and disturbing way. It's like when you're a young, stupid kid, and you find a YouTube video where Mario gets stabbed or some shit. I, I know this is a weird analogy, just hear me out. But I mean, th that's not so bad. You've seen Mario in Mortal Peril before. Getting stabbed is nothing, your stupid child brain thinks. And then you notice that he's bleeding. Not a whole lot, just a little. But there's still blood. And it kind of freaks you out. Something that's existed in a certain way in your head has just been recontextualized in a way that is pretty upsetting. And it disturbs you. That's what I get from Dust. 
And yeah, I know adding dark themes to New Vegas is a whole hell of a lot different than adding dark themes to Mario, but the point still stands that something you've created a deep attachment to for a certain amount of years has just been recontextualized in a really interesting, but really fucking disturbing way, too. That's what Dust does amazingly. And plus, it's not like New Vegas needs any more help being more disturbing. I mean, look how old some of its voice actors were. Hungry? Thirsty? Horny? The Atomic Wrangler has you covered. No, 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 no! So the general backstory and narrative of Dust are set up in, my opinion, perfectly. But narrative and atmosphere are just one thing. What about the game itself? What does it do to set up its atmosphere? And more importantly, what kind of mods can we use to get the most out of Dust? So, full disclosure, if you download Dust right now and hit play, it's not going to look like this. Or sound like this, for that matter. It would instead look a little bit like this. As I'm sure is obvious for a lot of you watching, I'm using a lot of different mods to help enhance the overall experience of Dust, both in a gameplay capacity as well as audiovisually, all of which I chose in the hopes of making the most immersive experience possible. Essentially, everything I picked was done so to help make Dust's atmosphere really come to life. And so, in the pursuit of transparency, I want to take you through a few of the more important mods that I've used here so that you can understand both what you're getting into and what you might want to end up using when you do your playthrough. Wink wink, nudge nudge. More on that later. Now, this isn't a modding guide, more so as it is a shitty top 10 list with very minimal technical explanation. I'm just going to give a cursory view of some of the more important mods that I use to get the experience that you're seeing on screen. First off, we have Mojave Sandstorms a mod that I use to achieve the, frankly, irresponsible level of particles on my screen. I use this mod for two reasons. The first being that I think having a lower level of visibility makes for more exciting combat encounters, as well as because, well, the base dust worldscape doesn't really get across the whole radioactive dust storms have taken over the Mojave concept that's established by the mod's backstory. So Mojave Sandstorms is a good way to rectify that, as well as add a little bit more entry to the gameplay. Two other mods I use are New Vegas Post-Apocalyptic and Apocalyptic Mojave, both of which are mods that seek to change certain areas in New Vegas' world space to make them look all the more decrepit, ruined, and just generally lived in. I recommend these mods for Dust both because it fits the atmosphere really well, but also because it kind of perfectly sells the idea of Dust happening 20 years after the base game events. I mean, it would make sense that some of the places you've been to or walked by in the base game Mojave would look different 20 years removed. I also recommend the mod Apocalyptic and Scary Prim as well. In regards to textures and visuals, I use a variety of different texture packs, such as Poco Bueno, NMC's texture pack, and a few other miscellaneous additions, with one of the more standout ones being Mojave Sandy Desert. I used the Dynamo ENB for all the gameplay portions of Dust that you'll see in this video, as well as the enhanced Shaders ENB for all the cinematic machinima scenes. One mod that I highly recommend downloading for your playthrough of Dust is the Digital Nightmare Music Mod, a mod that changes all the tracks in the game into dark, foreboding, industrial horror type beats, all of which fit the world space of Dust perfectly. There's over five hours of music specifically created to establish that dark tone and atmosphere that Dust is all about. And I, so fucking, I, I can't imagine a play through the mod without it. The last few mods that I have are just basic quality of life or gameplay enhancements that I think complement the mod really well. Things like weightless ammo, cause I'm a bitch. Bullet time, cause I'm a bitch. A few user interface and HUD mods, cause I'm a bitch that loves immersion. A handful of dust patches and add-ons, because the new Vegas engine is a bitch. And of course, live dismemberment. Because it's cool. Bitch. The last change that I made to my Dust playthrough was actually done manually by yours truly and isn't technically a mod. 
Ya Boy used his degree in audio production to switch out the many tracks available on the Mojave Music Radio, one of the few stations still operational in Dust, and replaced all of them with the music of Leland Kirby. Or, as many of you may know him better as, The Caretaker. Creating some, frankly, horrifyingly atmospheric moments. But adding mods is one thing, playing the game is a whole other. What can you expect while playing Dust? Well, if only there was a section directly after this one detailing that exact question. Sweet. Dust's gameplay is where the mod really shines, as it's pretty much a masterclass of taking all the concepts we've talked about and dialing them up right to fucking 11. Regardless of your chosen difficulty, Dust's game and resource rebalance completely change the way you interact with the world around you. True to most other survival horror experiences, Dust will have you constantly focused on resource management. This aspect of the gameplay presents itself in a handful of ways, each of which only serve to immerse you more and more into the mod itself. You'll find yourself obsessing over things that you may have never experienced in your original playthrough of De Vegas. Things like debating whether you should use this gun or that gun for any specific occasion, always fearful that you might make the wrong choice and end up wasting precious ammo that could have been better utilized down the road. Ammo is predictably short in supply these days. You know what they say, an armed society is a polite society, and the society of dust is... Rude. Let me amend that though, because saying that ammo is scarce is kind of misleading. What I should say is that good ammo is scarce in supply. However, to rectify this, Dust makes use of Junk Rounds, a weaker derivative of every ammo type that, while in greater abundance, will also absolutely destroy your weapon's condition before you can say, and since this type of ammo is weaker as well, you'll need to play another fun resource management game, as your constant battle of, do I have enough ammo to use this weapon for this given situation, becomes, what ammo type is the best choice for this situation? You may find yourself also needing to make small sacrifices along your journey as well, being forced to part with weaker guns that you have more ammo for in exchange for stronger weapons that are just too heavy to be carried alongside the rest of your arsenal. I believe in cryo gun supremacy. God damn it, it fucking crashed. This applies to healing as well, since these items are similarly scarce in the mod. It's not an exaggeration to say that a good 50% of any given playthrough of Dust will be spent in the many screens of your Pip-Boy, constantly checking stat and condition meters, managing your ever-depleting medical supplies, repairing your weapons, and playing the never-ending game of what am I willing to part with to make room for other stuff. It sounds awful on the face of it, but you learn to kind of love this sort of metagame very quickly, seeing the long minutes spent rifling through items as a needed respite from the endless gameplay loop of death and the rare parts in which you're not dying. I really can't oversell just how much of an effect that resource management has on any given playthrough of Dust, as your lack of healing items or ammo will both slowly bring up the tension as well as change the way you interact with the world. I've never been so excited to see corpses! Personally, I recommend playing Dust on the hardcore difficulty as well, so that way you have even more meters and stats to keep track of. But, believe it or not, there are even more engaging parts to Dust than just its item management. Primarily its combat system, and the way it handles enemy placement, enemy aggression, and the way you interact with the world as a whole. The world of Dust is a cruel place, and its denizens have adapted to not only survive in that cruelty, but thrive in it. You'll find all manner of nightmarish enemies during your flight from the Mojave, from carnivorous cannibals that have turned old settlements and townships into their own never-ending buffet, to endless hordes of tunnelers, just waiting with anticipation for you to take one step off the road. To make matters even worse, thanks to the difficulty and damage rebalance, just about every enemy you come across can kill you in just a few hits, regardless of what level you're at. This keeps every combat encounter as nails-bitingly tense as the last, since victory is 
never really assured, regardless of what your armor, arsenal, or health might make you believe. These concepts often make Dust feel almost cinematic, leading to some really cool frenetic moments where you just barely have enough ammo to kill the last cannibal attacking you, leaving you half wondering if you really did just survive that encounter or not. And trust me, that feeling isn't a one-off sort of thing either. Dust is such a fucking unforgiving mod that 9 times out of 10, unless you're going full Skyrim Stealth Archer, you're not surviving most combat encounters. Any game that makes me perform the scientific method to decide how I'm going to approach any given fight should be given an award. And a kick in the dick. But jokes aside, combat is an ever-evolving thing in Dust, and is something that, if you don't want this to be your top song listened to on Spotify Wrapped, you'll need to plan carefully. One of my favorite things about Dust is how little random occurrences can drastically change your approach to fighting. Take this for example. Littered through Dust are a few non-hostile NPCs who, just like you, seem to be cautiously traveling the roads, looking to escape this living hell. Some of these NPCs can even be bartered with, but if you're a sadistic monster like me, these NPCs play a completely different role. In this clip, I come across two traveling NPCs just a few feet away from Ranger Station Charlie, a location that has now, like most others, become a cannibal HQ. I guess it's just in vogue to eat people in the comfort of now-defunct military complexes. Luckily for me, these two travelers are making their way straight towards the ranger station as well. Now, I could either approach the situation two ways. Number one being following close behind them and aiding them in attacking the cannibals, using our strength and numbers to take them out one by one. Or, I could take a sniper's position up above and take out the remaining cannibals that my two new favorite meat shields weren't able to. Obviously, one of these is a lot more honorable than the other. But fuck honor, I don't want to be person of the year for Army Hammer Illustrated. The two travelers are dead now, each of them valiantly giving their lives so that I could continue on my way to Novak and die numerous times. But that sort of quick thinking as well as situational planning before a fight is what Dust is all about. It's a phenomenal gameplay loop of carefully charting out how you want to go about a combat encounter, learning the hard way why that first plan was stupid, and then adapting and eventually succeeding through trial and error. Taking on large enemy encampments like Prim or the NCR Outpost or fuck even Ranger Station Charlie are some of the toughest challenges in Dust, and also the most rewarding, as with every group of cannibals you take down, you have brand new opportunities to resupply or find weapons that might make your next big combat encounter even easier. I've never, never been, been so excited to see corpses! I've thrown around the word immersive a lot in the script, and will probably continue to do so because I'm morally opposed to buying a thesaurus, but the main reason I do so is because Dust Dust's gameplay and stat management really do just absolutely pull you into the setting of the game. Having to actively balance your character's needs of sleep, water, food, and general health make you all the more invested in the world you're playing in. It's like you're a Tomagachi pet, except you have to actively keep track of and ward off falling into complete fucking insanity. So it's like you're a Tomagachi pet. And also, that wasn't a joke, Dust adds in a completely new mechanic called Sanity, a replacement for the base game's karma system. If your character engages in too much monstrous shit, like killing innocents or taking the hardest drugs you can find or watching Oxhorn, your sanity will eventually go into the negative as you fully slip into madness. Contrary to popular belief, going insane does have its perks. Three to be exact. Each of which can drastically make you stronger, faster, or smarter depending on what you choose but all with significant downsides as well. I mean, this is insanity, baby, what would he expect? Personally, I recommend going insane as quickly as you can, as only then can you start to experience the really cool shit. God, that, that's gonna sound so fucking bad out of context. By cool shit, though, I mean hallucinations. A really cool feature in Dust that's only available once you're completely off your rocker. For only when you're completely batshit crazy, can you experience the watchful ghosts of past gamblers staring at you as you traverse the sewers beneath Vegas, shadow claws stalking the hills of Mount Charleston, just waiting for you to turn your back, or quadrupedal nightmares hunting in packs to the plague-ridden town of Good Springs, that one of these nightmares touch you and you'll be transported to a liminal space between this world and the next, forced to choose between multiple different doors before being spat out in some randomized place in the Mojave. In short, 
Dust's gameplay loops and added mechanics really bring them on to a whole nother level, one that I've never actually gotten from any of the New Vegas overhaul that I've played so far. All of its different features seem to work in tandem to just immerse you more and more and more into an addicting feedback loop that rarely ever gets boring. But gameplay is one thing. What does Dust have to say for itself for when it comes to storytelling? You'd be forgiven for thinking that Dust is nothing more than just a balls-to-the-wall dark survival mode for New Vegas, all stitched together with a few loose narrative threads here and there. But if you dare to look a little bit deeper into the story of Dust, you'll find a veritable treasure trove of tales and stories that would make even the original writers of New Vegas proud. You see, aside from literally a single radio broadcast in the sewers below Vegas, there are no other recorded lines of dialogue for Dust. As a result of this, the mod does nearly all of its storytelling through two means, its visuals and environments, or through lootable notes within the world space. These notes are exceptional examples of storytelling, always succeeding in immersing the player a little bit more into the world around them, whether they be eulogies for dead people littered across the Mojave, a panicked note from one of the few remaining survivors of an old world plague that's nearly annihilated Good Springs, or the insane ramblings of a Legion Centurion whose entire unit turned to cannibalism and slowly lost their minds before coming to venerate Novak's giant Dinky the Dinosaur as a sort of living god which is a great choice, honestly, top tier deity. Dust's storytelling really has it all. For anyone interested in piecing together what happened to either any specific location or just the Mojave as a whole, these notes are a one-way ticket to the past, painting a vague picture of the horrors that came before and always leaving you wanting more. Some people criticize Dust for its lack of voice acting or really any new dialogue whatsoever, but I see that as being a sort of boon for the mod. When your only option of storytelling is through terminal entries or bloodstained notes, then you better make sure that the storytelling is pretty damn good. Limitation breeds creativity and all that. Another thing that I love about the notes in Dust is that occasionally you'll find ones that seem to contradict the accounts of other notes you've read before. Most of these notes you're finding are just first-hand accounts from people who, in the grand scheme of things, probably aren't that reliable of authors overall. It's up to you, in the end, to try to piece together a cohesive narrative of what actually happened based on the available information. One such example of the authors of these notes being dead wrong is when it comes to the Courier. As I touched a bit on before, the Courier was initially successful at Hoover Dam, but was ultimately run out of Vegas by the NCR a short time after. What followed was a long-term disinformation campaign by the NCR to gradually paint the Courier as a literal boogeyman to the people of the Mojave, with many beginning to see him as the sole reason all these nightmarish things were happening. There are a few different notes about the Courier in Dust, most of which are pretty unsympathetic, all written by authors who seem to have completely bought the propaganda the NCR fed them. It's no wonder that by the time you meet him in Dust, the Courier's completely lost his mind. Yeah, you heard that right. The Courier is in Dust, and the journey to get to him might be one of the best examples of Dust's mastery in visual storytelling. Let me paint you a picture. For the past 20 years, the Courier, the person you played as in the base game, has been hunted mercilessly by the NCR, with full battalions of troops being sent out to kill him over and over and over again. His reputation ruined, all of his achievements stolen away, and living a life of endless pursuit, the courier gradually, but eventually, loses his mind, slowly becoming the monster that the NCR had long painted him as. By the time of the events of your dust playthrough all around, the courier has set up shop in a little cave located deep in the barren stretch of land known as Mead Canyon, formerly Lake Mead. Mead Canyon is pretty much a no man's land in every possible meaning of the word lined with elaborate booby traps, narrow passageways, and a seemingly infinite amount of landmines, the courier has gone to near insane lengths to make sure that no man or thing can leave unscathed. If the physical threats weren't bad enough, exploring Mead Canyon will bring you face to face with numerous mental ones as well, as you can find several macabre memorials to the courier's hatred of the NCR, whether they be handwritten notes, desecrated uniforms, or a literal message written in NCR Ranger corpses. Through just a few notes, visuals, and gameplay features, Dust is able to fully illustrate the broken mental state of the courier, 
as well as his lethality, without a single word of spoken dialogue. Finding the courier in dust is an incredible experience, especially if you're using audio mods as well in your journey through Mead Canyon. Hearing the sounds of industrial horror tracks ratcheting up the tension while I slowly maneuvered around the many death traps in the ravine was just unforgettable. And what actually happens when you meet the courier in dust? Well, that's an experience I'm not going to spoil for you, because that's up to you to see for yourself. But before we end this section on storytelling, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the marked men and the story of how Dust handles the Divide. One of the endings you can achieve in Dust requires you to make your way through Zion Valley, using the same escape route originally used by the Sorrows in one of the endings of Honest Hearts. Using this route takes you directly into a place called the Long Dark, a maze of seemingly endless dark corridors, leading to two potential places. The first is the Grand Staircase, one of the few safe places in Dusts and one of its endings, and the other taking you to the Divide. The Divide seemingly hasn't changed much since the events of New Vegas, save for a few new structures and some different looking enemies. Obviously, everyone is hostile to you. I mean, this is dust for God's sake. And it's not like the Divide was ever a welcoming place to begin with. But as you make your way through the Lonesome Road, you begin to slowly piece together the history of this place, looting notes from the now many corpses that dot the broken highways and finding old terminal entries detailing what's transpired over the past 20 years. It's only when you reach the end of the Divide, back at the entrance of the Hopeville Missile Silo, that you finally understand the great horror that you've just committed. After the events of Lonesome Road, the few remaining marked men are left to pick up the pieces of the courier and Ulysses' final confrontation. With their watchful guardian now gone, there remained uncertainty within the ranks of the marked men, with many wanting to return to their ravenous ways and even begin evading the Mojave. The new watchers are young, reckless. They do not understand the why of our duties. Twenty years ago, our people were weak. We followed, blindly, a false prophet with braided hair. He spoke to us of vengeance. Vengeance against those that had betrayed us to the wind and fire of the Divide. He told of us a monster more terrible than any other. He told us of how this monster killed the Divide, killed Ashton, how he set it aflame and laughed as it burned. But when the time came, when we saw this monster, we saw only a man. And within days, both had gone from this land, never to be seen again. They had killed each other with their hatred, no doubt. We were left with nothing but crumbling ruins to follow. Where would we go from there? We were lost. However, before they would even get the chance, a voice of reason would appear. A marked man by the name of Junaid came to show the marked men the errors of their ways and to instill within them a new way of life, one of peace and rebuilding. But then came Junaid. Junaid told us that our anger and pain was needless, that we still lived, and that life remained beautiful, even in the Divide. He showed us that even in the harshest places, life persists. One day, he took me to an empty stretch of desert. I saw nothing but rocks and ruins for miles. He asked me which of God's creatures there I found the most beautiful. I was confused, as there were none there but the two of us. Janaid only smiled and lifted up a rock to see. Underneath lay a mother mole rat and her pups asleep in their den. Yet this peace would not last for long. Shortly after the marked men, now calling themselves the Dust Walkers, began to rebuild and thrive in the Divide a group of tribals would emerge from the same entrance to the long dark that you did. The White Lakes, fleeing Zion and arriving in the Divide, began to destroy everything the Dust Walkers had built, killing countless innocents and burning much of their home to the ground. Twenty years ago, the Tunnel Men came through that mountain with painted faces and braided hair. 
They burned everything we had left. But we survived. We fought them back. In the deserts, in the caves, we fought them. And when the smoke cleared, we emerged victorious. Life persists. As the Dust Walkers rebuilt from this catastrophe, life slowly seemed to recover, as things began to get better and better. After the first coming, we were lured into a false sense of security. Under Junaid's leadership, we saw no limit to our growth. It was a time of peace and prosperity. We had food and water, and in time, even the storms calmed. And so we let down our guard. But only five years after the first attackers from the Long Dark invaded, the Sorrows and the Dead Horses, now a perverted facsimile of their former selves, would once again lay waste to the Divide. And once again, the Tunnelmen took advantage of our foolishness. No more the knotted hair, no, but the painted faces they still had. Well, perhaps a different style. They came again and burned down our tents. They burnt down our crops. They shot our sick and butchered our young. And this time, we had no more mercy. We tracked them to the very source, past the vault, through the dark, and we finished them. Despite coming face to face with a potential extinction only five years apart, the Dust Walkers persevered once more rebuilding, thriving, and becoming one of the most hospitable and welcoming places in all of Fallout. The Dust Walkers made tight bonds with other tribes in the Divide, found ways to purify their water, and did what just about every other main faction in the series wishes that it could do. In short, things were good. Great, in fact, for the denizens of the Divide. Yet while peace reigned for 15 years, the Dust Walkers had only become more cautious forever vigilant for another invasion of these so-called Tunnelmen. Twenty years ago, the Tunnelmen burned our villages. We forgave them. They returned five years later with different tattoos and burned our villages a second time. We are done forgiving. If ever a soul opens that door, know that it is evil and its life shall not persist. The Tunnelmen may come in many forms. The paint of their faces may change, but their heart never will. Any who come through that door are evil, and any who come through that door shall die. It's easily one of Dust's most interesting and tragic stories overall. There's just something so inspiring about reading about the Dust Walkers and how these people who were nearly annihilated three times kept rebuilding and kept going on. Their indomitable spirit moving them forward to keep rebuilding despite the horrors that had come before them in a place that it seems like no one will be able to survive. Like they're doing things that people in the base game of New Vegas struggle to do. And this is the divide in dust. So it's fucking astounding. However, it's made all the more tragic when you realize how you're actually learning this story. Because you're only learning all these pieces of lore by killing these people and by looting their corpses. And the more and more you piece together about what happened to them in the past, the more obvious your part in these people's blood-soaked history becomes all the more clear. The final nail in the coffin is when you reach the end of the divide and find Junaid's corpse. The final note on his person, making everything fall into place. Below, I hear the fighting. This is the third coming of the Tunnel Men. It was foretold, foretold by the child of prophecy who came to me in my darkest hour and gave me the faith to continue on. To the leader of the Tunnelmen, I speak now to you. 
From this day forth, you are cursed. You shall never find a safe place in this wasteland, for you have taken it from the earth this day. All that was beautiful, all that was calm, you burned. Go back to your tunnel and die there, for you shall find no absolution in this world. Junaid of the Dustwalkers. Junaid has killed himself, unable to witness the destruction of his people for a third time. The indomitable spirit of the Dustwalkers, the spirit to rebuild, to love, and to thrive is once again destroyed by the Tunnelmen. Destroyed by you. It all makes horrific sense to you now. The only reason that the Dustwalkers attacked you was because you emerged from the same door that the last two groups of invaders did. They attacked you because past destruction had taught them that only monsters emerge from that door. Monsters who wish to kill and destroy and end their way of life. And they were right. You've unknowingly become these people's prophesied doombringer, the final nightmare to emerge from the tunnel, and the deadliest yet. It's heart-wrenching, tragic, and incredibly depressing, and fucking amazing storytelling. To make matters worse, if you go up the ladder next to Junaid's corpse, you're just spat out right back in the Mojave meaning that if you actually want to make it to safety, you have to retrace your steps through the entirety of the Divide, coming face to face with the horrors you brought upon these people, reliving the carnage you laid upon them. For a mod that has little to no spoken dialogue and has to do all of its storytelling through either notes, terminal entries, or environmental context clues, Dust is able to tell a full, tragic, and beautiful story of hope and destruction, one that I've yet to ever experience in any other game. I won't lie to you and say that the entire rest of Dust's storytelling is on the same level as the Divide and the Dust Walker story, but if you at all enjoyed any of what we just went over, then I think you'd find the mod has a lot to offer you. And well, I guess that's as good as any segue to get into our next section. <laughs> So this is the part of the video where I try to persuade you to play Dust. And every part of my being is screaming at me to just make this a purely persuasive, analytical, like, here's all the pros and cons and why you're fooling yourself not to. But that feels disingenuous to the mod and to myself and how much I enjoy it. So I'm going to take a bit of a different route. Dust is not the best mod ever created on a technical level. It's buggy. It's New Vegas, for Christ's sake. So it's going to be buggy no matter what. It doesn't have extremely long dialogue and scripted scenes with new and interesting characters. There's rarely any locales whatsoever. Very few new NPCs. It's essentially the same world space. Again, it's technically very limited by what's available to it, and at the end of the day, it is just a mod made by people. However, Dust has managed to find its way in my load order every single time I restart at New Vegas. No matter what. I think what endears me so much to Dust is just how much love and thought was put into creating it. The mod doesn't just feel like a grim dark fan fiction created by a few fans of the original game. No, Dust feels like a sort of actual successor 
to New Vegas. I've had this thought quite a few times in my playthroughs of Dust, and I'm sure anyone else who's willing to give the mod a go will have this exact same experience, but it's hard to shake this consistent thought of, I could see this happening after the events of New Vegas. I know it's strange to say it, but Dust feels like a sort of micro-sequel to New Vegas, complete with the same compelling storytelling, interesting locations, and sense of humor that permeate the base game. Now, I can't force you to play Dust, at least not while I'm limited by this human form, but the point being here that if you were at all like me, going into Dust and not really being big on survival horror or uh, that kind of like resource management heavy type of gameplay, or if you're a seasoned veteran for that kind of stuff and you've played games similar to that, I think that you'd really get a lot out of Dust, regardless of where you're coming from here. Because believe it or not, there's even more really cool stuff I didn't even go over in this video that I don't want to spoil for you, at least not in this format, that new players and those who are more seasoned to this kind of genre will really, really like. Things like why the Strip is currently covered in a more potent version of the Cloud. Whatever happened to Elijah in the Sierra Madre? The story of the Forecaster in a slow descent into madness. The horrifying rumors about the 12-foot-tall monster stalking the ruins of Zion Canyon. Or, most importantly, how even though entire factions and civilizations have been wiped from the face of the Earth, fucking somehow, the tunnel snakes still rule. You're a real bastard, you know that? There is so much cool stuff about dust that I didn't even go into this video for either three reasons. One because I haven't found it myself, two, I don't want to spoil it for you, or three, because I may have had an ulterior motive in creating this video. And this may in fact not be the last time that I'll be talking about dust on my channel. You see, I haven't been exactly fully transparent with you, because a lot of the content you saw in this video wasn't made specifically just for this video. What do I mean by that? Well, you see, back in 2020, when I initially played through Dust, I and a few others decided to create a sort of limited lore series for the mod, based on and kind of similar to ShoddyCast's Fallout lore series from so long ago. May it rest in peace. And that's pretty much where all the machinima pieces that were used in this video were created for. So, if you like that, then good news, bucko, I got like 300 more of those to show off for you. But yeah, it's still in production right now, we're still putting together things, I'll be voice acting it, so if that's a draw, then great, if it's a determent, understand that too. Better fucking watch it though, it'll be out when it's out. <laughs> if you're at all interested in playing Dust, or just modding New Vegas in general, then I highly suggest checking out Dark Populous' full modding guide on how to properly install everything and get it to work. He hasn't made a tutorial on Dust per se, but he'll still be able to teach you the very basics of modding, and from there it should be easy enough to do it yourself. Also, as a little testimonial, his tutorials are literally the only modding guides that I have ever fucking worked for me. Like, whatsoever. And I've been trying to mod the game for the past, like, eight years. So, go and give him some love. Hey, Spaceman Scott. I'm glad you like it, man. So, in short, Dust is great. And I like it. And I think if you played it, you'd like it too. See, that wasn't such a bad... Hey, party people! Scotty Tomcat here with the pre-outro outro. The first and probably last of its kind. So, uh, as one of you may be aware, I have a Patreon now. Uh, and I was gonna wait to actually, like, publicly talk about it until the next upload so I could, you know, finish setting it up. But, uh, some of you have already found it and pledged money! So, I'm doing it now! No, but seriously, I, I wanted to make a little bit of an announcement now, just so I wouldn't have to keep the people that have actually given me money so far hanging for the next several months. So, um, yeah, thanks, everybody. But, hey, if we're gonna do this, which we're doing this, we're doing it my way. Future Scott editing this? Play the fucking Sonic music. Did you know I have a Patreon? Ever wanted to support me in a way that goes a little bit further than just sliding into my DMs and saying I look handsome? Why, thank you, I agree. Then you can do that today! Patrons have the chance to earn all kinds of neat bonuses, like special behind-the-scenes info on videos both past and future, early access to my video essays, the option to vote on and suggest future video topics, some Patreon-exclusive videos, this sticker, and the chance to get your hands on some exclusive video assets in high quality like this image set of Mario getting stabbed. 
Now I just know there's a few of you sick motherfuckers out there who would just love a chance to set this sad Italian man's cold, broken eyes as your desktop wallpaper. <laughs> and of course, that chance to hear my dulcet tones thank you personally at the end of the next video. Let's do that now. Nana Neo Bard. That's it. That's actually all the patrons we have thus far. Also, I don't know how to control the speed in which this scroll. A big thank you to Nana Neo Bard for being my first ever patron. Your patronage is actually fucking amazing and is beyond anything I could have ever imagined when I started this channel like eight years ago. Uh, also, thanks for helping this video get over 50 minutes, hell yeah! But for real, the, uh, Patreon exists if you want to join, uh, but if you don't have the expendable income to throw at some fucking stranger online, uh, then you can support me another way by liking and subscribing if you liked and subscribed this video. That way we can convince the YouTube algorithm that I actually want to put food on the table, and sometimes have on more than just three lights at a time in my house. As I'm sure a lot of you realize, I can't monetize these videos because I use copyrighted music and say bad words. Anything y'all can do to help me would be neat. But, at the end of the day, I just appreciate you all watching this far and for sticking around to see what comes next. Uh... I feel like I had more here. Is there anything else I can say in my announcer voice? Oh, here we go. Trans rights are human rights! Fuck TERFs! And play Fallout Dust! Now, Future Scott, make sure when you're editing this in the future that you have the actual outro cut me off mid- -season.